Test Automation at Scale, Lessons from Top Performing Distributed Teams, presented by Applitools. We have an outstanding panel of hands-on technical leaders joining us for what we expect to be a lively discussion today. We have Eric Terry, the Director of Quality Control at Eversana InTouch, Ariola Chiopolsi, Test Automation Lead at Accenture, Kyle Penniston, Senior Software Developer at Bayer, and finally, our moderator, Anand Bagwar. Anand is the Software Quality Evangelist and a Solution Architect here at Apple Tools. With that, let's start the discussion today. I'm Anand Bagmar, Senior Solution Architect, Quality Evangelist with Apple Tools. I've been part of the quality space, started with testing, part of the quality space now for more than 20 years, worked in various different uh, countries, worked in product and services organizations. And let me tell you, these years have not been too kind on me. That's one of the primary reasons why I've been losing hair. Because I've been in testing, it's not very straightforward. Uh, that said, I don't want to scare anyone who's not been in the space as long as I have. Of course, you'll have better experiences. But let's get started with the discussion today. And the, first, I would like our panelists to introduce themselves by answering this question first. What does test automation at scale mean to you as an individual? And how do you know you are successful in scaling your automation? So it's a two part question. I'll repeat the question. What does test automation at scale mean to you? And how do you know, how do you know if you are successful in scaling your automation? Let's start with Eric. Your introduction, how do you answer this question? And then you could hand it over to our next panelist. All right, thanks, Anand. Uh, yeah, my name is Eric Terry, and I'm the Director of Quality Control at Eversound InTouch. Uh, I've been in the software uh, building and testing space for 20 years, and like Anand, uh, a lot of hair is gone or gray. <laughs> so, again, not to scare off any of the newer folks, uh, but that's just something to look forward to. Uh, as far as what testing uh, to test automation to scale means for me is the ability to cover all of or most of our testing efforts uh, at will. Uh, like if, if we have new capacity coming online, we need to be able to uh, account for that. Uh, how do I measure the success is uh, how often we are able to actually meet that metric of being able to cover the, that those testing uh, needs. Uh, let's see. And I guess I will pass it over to Ariola. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I'm Ariola Tupaposhi. I'm the test automation lead here at Accenture. Um, I'm part of the next gen engineering group, my focus being in quality engineering. So my expertise kind of varies from creating and managing frameworks for automation for point of sale systems, web, mobile and API applications. So for test automation at scale, that what that means to me is more around the ability to implement and manage testing, including frameworks and the processes um, across a large environment. So this can be a complex software systems or enterprise level applications. So for example, if you're thinking of a proof of concept that you start in the UK and how you kind of build that up globally, how I can make sure that we are successful in scaling is how much we are reducing our manual testing effort how frequent we're finding defects, how we're incorporating pipelines within this global um, type of framework. But the key factor is about the feedback. So as you scale your automation, you should be getting more and more feedback from the various stakeholders and how that kind of helps with your um, metrics as Eric has said as well. I'll pass it over to Kyle. Thanks, Ariella. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kyle Penniston. I'm a senior software developer at Bayer, specifically the crop science division here in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I mostly deal with marketing websites at the moment using Adobe Experience Manager. Um, and I also handle all of our supporting infrastructure, APIs, testing frameworks, um, 
uh, scripts that make our work go faster and, and uh, better. Um, for the question, um, I uh, our team has a motto that we build the right things and we build things right. Uh, and that also kind of extends into testing where we want to test the right things at the right time. So for scaling, uh, we like to look at the software testing pyramid where you've got uh, all your different types of testing, unit testing, regression, integration, end-to-end, -end, and user acceptance. Uh, all of these things have associated costs, time, money, and manual effort by uh, um, our developers, QA, and business people. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have lots of fast and cheap tests that we can run as much as we want, and they have little impact on our uh, speed of delivery. And then towards the top of the pyramid, you have um, smaller and smaller uses of more intensive uh, time, money, or people uh, tests at the top. So our goal is maximizing the value we get at each level, um, and we work our way up as our code moves towards release through our different uh, environments. Uh, so for example, unit testing on every build um, makes sense. We can do that. It takes 20, 30 seconds. We can do that thousands of times in a two-week period. Uh, regression and integration, integration testing, we don't want to do on every build because that really doesn't provide a lot of value for us for the investment. So we would handle that just once per story in a QA server. And our end-to-end -end testing we do in our um, pre-production server once per sprint, just to make sure everything's working the way we expect it to before we release it. Um, so there's always trade-offs and uh, how we measure that we're being successful at our test automation is that our developers aren't saying we're spending too much time waiting for tests. And at the same time, our business people aren't saying things are going with bugs into production. So we kind of, every level of that pyramid, we shift it left or right earlier or later in our process so that we get the most value um, without the teeter-totter going too far either direction. Thank you. Awesome. So many interesting tidbits I already got to hear from all of you. Uh, metrics, of course, which metrics we look at is very important as well. We spoke about shift left. Uh, I love the aspect what Ariola mentioned, right? The key thing, how you know automation is adding value is my manual testing effort getting reduced. That's why we automate, right? That's the first th reason why we would want to automate. So, and Kyle, you mentioned about shift left, the pyramid, the different types of tests, the faster feedback, when to run what type of test. These are very, very interesting aspects and of course, very valuable. The question of course is, can we use all of that in each and every context? And that's what we'll explore more when we talk uh, today. So uh, while we, uh, while I ask the next question, this question is also for our participants. Please uh, want to hear, we all want to hear what you think about these questions and uh, contribute to answering them as well. So the question is, an audience, uh, you could use the word cloud uh, in the polls to answer this one, because that's what will uh, give a lot of uh, a good sense of what, as a whole, the community is feeling, the industry is feeling in terms of challenges in scaling your test automation. So I'll repeat the question for the participants. What are the challenges you face in scaling your test automation? Please add this as uh, the word cloud poll. And I would like our panelists now, I will uh, take the name first and we'll go around. I would want you to talk about one challenge that you have faced in the past when it comes to test automation and scaling it. And of course, you cannot repeat what the other person has said, right? Otherwise, what's the use? Uh, there's no fun in that. Uh, so one challenge, a quick description of what that challenge was, what was the impact of that? And we'll come to dive deep into those uh, once we get the word cloud poll as well. So Kyle, let's start with you. What is that one challenge you faced, which you hope you will never have to go through again? What was the impact of that challenge? Yes, so this is something that was fairly recent. Um, our biggest challenge uh, is getting started and building the habit of testing. Um, so you can't, you can't scale what you don't have. Um, so any automated testing is infinitely better than none. 
Um, so for example, if you're taking over a project from a vendor or another team, or you've joined the new team whose project has zero automated tests, you can get in some serious difficulties. Uh, so a couple of months ago, um, this was not my specific team, but a team whose work runs in, uh, in our system. Uh, we were migrating to a new platform that had a built-in uh, build and distribution pipeline, and their pipeline required 50% code coverage. And our sister team had no code coverage. They had no tests. Um, so normally, we would we would just like take 10% of our sprint and just dedicate that towards backfilling tests. Uh, which is nice until you uh, have a deadline where your license for the prior platform is expiring in a month. Uh, and that meant that that team spent um, an entire month adding no business value to their user experience. All they were doing was writing JUnit tests for four weeks to, to get it migrated before that deadline hit. Um, and we would have had to pay licenses for another year. Uh, so the, the takeaway from that is never undervalue testing because uh, you never know who will be running it or where it will need to be running in a month. Awesome. So no test automation or very limited test automation. And when you integrate, it causes a different kind of um, uh, impact. Okay. Yeah. The, the industry is improving their standards and uh, we need to make sure that we're keeping a pace with that. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Uh, Eric? All right. Uh, I thought Kyle was going to take mine since he mentioned uh, marketing. Uh, mine is definitely the frequent rework of sites. So our, our, we're a marketing agency, and of course, we take care of a lot of different uh, brands out there. Uh, and our brands are... Uh, are kind of regulated by the FDA. And so there are a lot of back and forth that we have to do uh, with the brands and with those teams in order to get the content out the door correctly. Uh, you can imagine how much of an uh, issue that is if you're trying to automate something that is constantly changing. Uh, so uh, one of the things that uh, Apple Tools uh, has come out with that we're really interested in is the self-healing uh, test. Uh, because I think that will allow us to uh, move a bit further to the left and not not have to worry about the amount of changes that come through. So you know, if if you know content changes or selector or something like that changes, we're not stuck with brittle tests that are constantly failing. Uh, we're able to just kind of keep moving as those changes come through, and we're able to increase. Uh, the amount of test coverage that we have uh, and, and be uh, confident that that we're, we're getting the right test and, and catching the right things. Yeah, oh, definitely. So frequent rework uh, and the impact on automation and the impact of testing on all the different platforms and devices yes. as well, I'm guessing, right? Absolutely, so that, absolutely. That's a big one as well. Oh, makes sense. Uh, Ariola? Yeah, so from my side, um, at Accenture, we work with a lot of different clients. The projects are all varied. Um, the biggest challenge is trying to incorporate shift left testing when we can't actually achieve it. So although kind of shift left testing has been around for over 20 years, sometimes it's still a challenge, um, especially when, let's say, you're testing cycle comes at the very end of the software being developed and how do you actually accomplish that really because shift left is all about doing it testing early testing often um, so the biggest challenge there was trying to think of a way that you could use the some of the same techniques of shift left but incorporate that when you're testing at the end of the life cycle uh, absolutely so shift left yes it's the concept has been around for a long time, but it's a concept, right? To put it into action, it's a completely different ball game. So I can completely relate to that. Thanks for sharing that challenge. Uh, let's uh, take another round uh, of challenges because I'm sure we've faced more than one uh, in our uh, past. 
So, you know, Kyle, coming back to you. Um, I think one of the other uh, big challenges that we have seen, and I see it in the in the word cloud now, is product changes. Uh, so I started with Apple Tools four years ago um, when it was fairly new, um, and especially early on, there was uh, constant new development going on um, where I would ha have to go in and, and change my tests uh, to use different functions, different parameters, uh, different ways of doing things. Um, fortunately, it's fairly stable now. I'll, I'll give a shout out to Apple Tools. It's, it's a nice thing to work with now. Um, but we're currently um, doing a cycle of reevaluation of all of our testing tools. So we've got four or five uh, different candidates that we're looking at. We use two of them right now, and we're doing a reevaluation. Um, that'll probably end up being about an annual basis, maybe every two years, just to make sure that all of the things that we need to do, we're using the right tool um, and making sure that even if it's a tool we've already used, that we know what the new opportunities are with that tool uh, that we can take advantage of. So that's another commitment that uh, kind of needs to be built into your schedule to take a look at these things because they're constantly changing and adding uh, new um, new tools. So making sure that you know what's available and where you can get it from. OK. So if I have to summarize what I understand out of this, you're saying that you might end up with a lot of different types of tools. They might not be very efficient or different ways of working. It's very important to take a step back, reevaluate see what the tool sets you're using. Is there something new that you need to have? And how do you get that commitment across the organization at least for a couple of years so you can invest and get value from that? Uh, is that what uh, it is? Yep, and uh, alongside that, we also give all of our dev teams fairly free reign with how they accomplish their tasks. So we might end up with uh, different teams using three different tools to accomplish the same thing. So we're paying for three different licenses, when we could probably cut that down to one. Uh, yep. So taking a look at that as well is also very important. Awesome. Oh, makes sense. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. So I think when you've got the different versions of tools, I think that is a difficult challenge that you want to try and keep up with. But sometimes it's the actual testing infrastructure itself that can be a problem, whether that means um, you've got opposing ideas that your client has. So for instance, they would like to use a specific tool, um, whereas you'd want to use another one. Like an example is if someone wants to use Cypress and you want to use Selenium based on the skill set, how do you kind of um, get past that? And that is something that we've also faced in our side. So definitely uh, test infrastructure is an important one. So uh, are you at a is that really infrastructure or is that you're not using the tools based on the expertise of the team because someone is asking you to use that? Just trying to make sure we, uh, uh, to understand that. Better. Yeah, I think it's both. I think it's trying to do um, a tool set that fits your team, but also mm -hmm. trying to obviously meet client demands. And I think there is an element of both. Um, you obviously want to pick a tool set that fits the actual business requirements. So I think there is that element on that side as well. Makes sense, makes sense. And since uh, you are unmuted right now, what's the next challenge you would like to highlight? Okay, um, so another challenge that we faced is uh, localization. And once your project goes from, let's say from a UK based project to Germany or Austria, and you want to use the same framework, what the challenge of that can be um, quite large if you're not having a specific framework that utilizes that. You want to be able to test the different UIs, whether that is something simple as the date format or so on, whether or to the actual language. Um, and that can have a large impact if you're not thinking about the future when you create frameworks. Absolutely. Uh, the languages is still something that we can think of easily based on the type of product, but date yeah. format, that can be a yeah. big challenge. <laughs> that could be a big challenge. Okay. 
Great. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Eric. Uh, sure. I, I think Ariola and Kyle both kind of touched on this a bit with the tool. Uh, the tooling that we use, I mean, we're we're pretty fortunate in that we get to pick the tooling that we want to use for our automation efforts. Uh, the challenge that we face is that we're not always in control of the environments where testing has to happen, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so <laughs> it, it, when we are in control of it, uh, you know, we're able to get code pushed to an environment that, you know, we're ready to go and we can just do what we need to do in it. Uh, but, you know, if you have a client uh, who is in control of their IT environment and they use uh, like a custom version of AEM or, you know, some custom uh, version of Salesforce and, and you don't have good access to them. And then, of course, they're across the globe. And so now you have timing issues uh, where you're just losing time based on you know, where we're located versus where they're located, uh, the communication that uh, has to go into that, we have to, we have to really amp that up to make sure uh, that we get what we're looking for when we're looking for it so that we can keep these projects moving along. So I, I would definitely say just disbursement of uh, client and environments and ownership. I like what you did there, Rick. You spoke about three, four different challenges in one. <laughs> <laughs> so you spoke about test execution environments, time zones, you know, different languages, and different languages also automatically. I'm guessing, uh, if I make uh, make that statement right, different languages also mean different cultures. Sure. Different ways Absolutely. of interpreting uh, the same information. So miscommunication, misinterpretation can happen very easily. Uh, I'm taking this, I'm talking right now to everyone. It is 8.30 p.m. India time. And somewhere it's going to be morning, you know, you're joining in in the morning time. It's a different aspect. I'm at the end of the day, there's fatigue seeping in. You are fresh in the morning. But the way we are communicating, there's very possible to have gaps in understanding, gaps in articulation, right? And Absolutely. that will have a huge impact on how the rest of your day is going to be. I'm going to go <laughs> off and sleep, but you have to live with my misinterpretation right now, right? So uh, yeah, yeah. these are very interesting challenges that are coming across. And I'm sure there are many more, but quickly going to the word cloud, what teams are talking about, right? Uh, what our audience is saying, there is aspects of collaboration. That is a big challenge. And I'm guessing, uh, again, it's because of multiple teams, different time zones that you're coordinating, how do you collaborate with them? In fact, I've had challenges with a large pro a team split into smaller teams on different floors of the same office building. How do you collaborate with them as well, right? Because a minute out of, you're out of sight of someone, you need to find better means of collaboration. And without that, again, there's going to be problems. Other challenges that we have are uh, uh, maintenance, Infrastructure we spoke about, uh, rework we spoke about, change, uh, testability, skills, Ariola mentioned as well, the skill sets on uh, different tools, technologies, uh, domains, uh, that also comes across. Uh, would any one of you want to add to any of these challenges or speak a little bit about some of these challenges? Uh, sure, I can kind of speak to the skills. Uh, Primarily when I joined, uh, we were, uh, you know, a manual testing shop. Uh, and so, you know, getting people the opportunity to skill up, to learn uh, a bit of uh, coding and programming skills to help them, uh, going through and looking at the types of work that we do uh, versus the types of tools that were out there, I. I felt kind of responsible of not putting too much burden on them right up front. Uh, like I had a Java and C sharp background from the programming that I've done, but you know, that took me a long time to get, you know, pretty useful at doing, <laughs> at doing those, those types of things. And so I was really looking for something that had a, a lower uh, uh, entry barrier. Uh, and I, I landed on Cypress uh, to me, uh, the type of work that we did, uh, with a lot of different like marketing sites that were constantly just go, go, go. Uh, I felt that 
Selenium, although it's probably king of you know web apps and things like that, it was just overkill for the types of testing that we needed to do. So I really tried to shrink down the skill set uh, needed to be successful uh, uh, automating for our, our company. Yeah, oh, makes sense. Uh, Pankaj has a comment uh, in chat about one of the major challenges about derive uh, he's facing is about deriving automation test cases from the manual test cases, right? And that again leads to the aspect of bloatware, maintenance issues that comes across. And I am immediately going to relate it to what Kyle mentioned in his introduction about how he approaches the test pyramid, more tests at the lower ends, the unit tests or the API tests of sorts. And you get very frequent and quick feedback on those. And that is one of the techniques that I can immediately think of for that challenge, right? How do you really address it? Identify the test cases, push it as low in the pyramid as possible. But uh, that is something that I think is a pretty common challenge as well. So I'm sure we can talk about challenges for a long, long time. Uh, let's talk about some of the enablers. It's it's, we don't want to make it just a ranting session and venting off session, right? Uh, let's try to put some uh, interesting things that we might have come across that has helped us in our role for our teams, for our product to get better. So let's talk about that. Uh, so we spoke about a bunch of challenges, tools not fit for purpose, rework, shift left, speed of change, no automation, localization, execution environment, time zones, culture and language, uh, the bloatware that is there. What are the key enablers that you think can help in this perspective? And let me paint a little bit more of a context over here when we think about scale, right? And let's try and uh, answer these or come up with solutions, share solutions in that context. When we talk about scale, when I talk about scale, it's not just hundreds or thousands of tests. It is there are n number of teams across multiple cities, countries, geographies that are contributing towards building a complex product. Is that really the need? That's a different question. But there is a lot of work happening uh, from many people across different places to contribute to building this product. Many a times, it is not just one organization that is working on this. There could be different partners and vendors contributing towards making that happen. They could take off the slice of work independently, or they could be contributing to specific roles. Like, for example, development is done by someone else, uh, the testing and automation is done by someone else for various different reasons, right? With that context in mind and putting these challenges in that perspective, how can we use certain practices, processes, technology, tools? to help make this better, to help remove some of these challenges. Eric, let's start with you. What are some of the things you have done in such cases to help yourself and your team? Yeah, so it really just comes back to me for the communication and collaboration piece of it. Like we have to just understand we are where we are, right? Like we <laughs> we have a remote team on the US side uh, mm -hmm. and of course we have a, a team in Mumbai uh, and, you know, we just make it work. We communicate on a daily basis, uh, making sure that uh, anything, uh, since they're ahead of us, anything that they're not able to achieve, that we understand the status of that so that we can work that into whatever schedule that we already have going for today so that we can all be successful. Uh, when it comes to, again, working with different clients around the globe, uh, the communication there, working you know with our account uh, team and our PMO team, just making sure that the messages get to them uh, so that they understand, again, whatever pain points that we're going through, and we need to understand whatever pain points they're going through. So I get, we could see each other as human. You know, it's it's really hard sometimes to like see a bunch of faces on the screen and really feel that connection, but we. We feel that you know communication and collaboration is just key to overcoming most any challenge that we that we come across. Okay, uh, definitely makes sense. I want to add a few more things to that, but uh, Kyle, Ariela, do you want to add anything to what Eric said about communication collaboration? 
Yeah, from my side, um, we use Agile for a lot of that. So communication and collaboration just completely, definitely important, as Eric's mentioned. And a lot of the ceremonies that Agile allows us to do um, helps a lot with that. So just like um, our in our Accenture, we've got teams in the UK and then in India and America and South Africa. So obviously you've got different time zones, but having a certain let's say um like a sprint stand up every day at a time that kind of is appropriate to the team whether that means um early in the morning for um us in the uk to kind of satisfy with the india team or kind of fixing a time to allow that um the same with the retros and the reviews the only way that we're building quality is to kind of foster that environment that you've got the different teams coming together, whether that is the development team, the testing, or you've got product owners getting involved as well. And that's the only way that you can build a quality product that actually satisfies the business requirements. So definitely that is a key factor in anything really that we do in software development. Oh, makes sense. Oh, ways of established ways of working. Oh, definitely very important in distributed teams. Kyle? Yeah, I was going to echo pretty much everything that Ariola said. Um, sprint planning and sprint retrospectives. Uh, ours are two week sprints. So twice a month, uh, we're getting together with any of our teams that um, we don't usually uh, have uh, daily stand ups with. Um, and, and we just, it, that's our by uh, twice a month communication is what are you building? and how do we test it? And then two weeks later, did we do what we said that we were gonna do um, in our review and retrospective? So um, it doesn't necessarily need to be down at a developer level. It could be at a product manager level. It could be a specialist, um, or if you have dedicated testing people, um, maybe they're the ones that get together every two weeks and, and go down the checklist and make sure that everything's been handled. Okay. Uh, I echo with, all the things that uh, you have mentioned, but I think that does open a different can of worms. Okay. And I'm just going to share my perspective. First of all, I completely agree with what you're saying it, because without that discipline and the rigor of making sure we are going to collaborate with the other uh, team members across different uh, locations, it is just going to fall apart on day two itself, if not day one, right? So you have to make sure that discipline is there and we value sharing that information as much as getting the information uh, from each other so that we can continue keep that ball rolling uh, almost pretty much 24 by seven. The can of forms that it opens for me in that sense, right, is first of all, is it really scalable for the team to continue doing this day in, day out on long running projects? having early morning standups or team members who have to log in late at night, different time zones, right? It's, I'm sure everyone is compromising some or other uh, part of their life to make sure the collaboration happens. How long can you keep going on that? And how can you avoid that burnout? Because eventually one does burn out. I've done that. I'm sure you have gone through similar experiences as well, right? So how can you avoid that burnout and avoid that challenge? And for that, there are certain things that we have done uh, in the past. One is, of course, now, thankfully, pandemic over, we can start travel again, frequent travel, not regular, but as required, frequent travel again to different offices. That definitely breaks down the culture and the language barrier. You get to know the person better when you speak with them instead of just being on a call, on a video call with them, right? It builds a better empathy and understanding towards you know, each other over there. Second, you, know, you mentioned the processes, practices that is there. A very important aspect of that is also a common set of tools, regardless how many different organizations are coming together to collaborate, using a common set of tools and having the discipline to maintain and use that effectively is the only way you can all actually rely on that information being accurate instead of someone having to get up in the middle of the night or early morning 
to be on a call to explain what is going on. You want to try and reduce those as much as possible as well, right? So these are just a few things that I wanted to share in addition to what uh, you mentioned. Collaboration is the key. Communication is the key. Though process might be an overloaded word, many people, including myself, do not like process too much. But without process, there is chaos. So you need to have the minimal amount of process in place that will allow that discipline and communication and collaboration to happen. And these other techniques of uh, frequent travel, uh, using common tools, that's real-time dashboards. That becomes a very important aspect to share progress so that the other team can take it forward uh, from there. Sorry, I added my pitch over here, but I just had to get it out there. Okay. Uh, would, uh, would you want to add anything to that? Uh, any other techniques or things that you have done in the past to aid in the collaboration and communication? I mean, I would just say um, our, our touchstone is flexibility. Um, having processes is a fantastic way to start. But once you've gone a sprint or two sprints or a quarter in any project, uh, it, it's time to look back and see what was working, what wasn't working, and figure out how to reset uh, what your expectations are for the next increment. Yeah. Yeah, to, to add to that, the flexibility uh, component, uh, I know it drives a lot of folks on my team in particular crazy because they're very regimented of like, this is the process. Uh, but to Kyle's point, like you really have to be flexible and uh, do the best you can uh, to make sure that we make it to the finish line. Yeah. I think that's where the agile fluency model also comes into picture, right? You start with a checklist driven approach because that's how you would start. You don't know any better. You start off based on a set of checklists. So these are the things that I need to do. I need to have a stand up. I need to have a sprint planning meeting, a retrospective. But then you start doing those things and you start becoming agile, right? You start believing in those practices because of the value it is adding. The flexibility that you are speaking about is based on that. This thing did not work. Let's change and make it better. What is going to make it easier for us, right? So becoming agile is very important. You have to move from the prescriptive approach to becoming agile. And that's where uh, collaboration communication becomes a very natural way of evolving. Okay. So let's move to another enabler, right? Uh, of course, without the backing of a established process, a way of working, agile, or any variant of that, you would have chaos. What else is required to really make your test automation scalable and get value for it? Shall I take the reins on this one? <laughs> Yeah, so um, I'd like to go back to that first challenge then regarding the test infrastructure. So when, let's say, you have opposing ideas with the different software and tools that you want to use, it is important to try and get in like a full understanding of what tools, what the business requirements look like, and then get an understanding of how to implement them. So I think an enabler in that case is doing like a full analysis of the requirements that will be coming, but also in the future. So take an example of the localization. If we were thinking of wanting to use Cypress for our testing, but we potentially wanted to use behavior driven development. So um, we want to kind of use that approach to writing our behaviors. Now we may know that BDD and Cypress don't integrate very well but what we know is um, a tool like Apply Tools itself can actually help with the language aspect of it. So using the eyes um, part from Apply Tools kind of helps with looking at the different UIs or the language elements. So then we come to the conclusion of, wait, yes, we'll go with the Cypress approach, but then we'll intertwine that with Apply Tools. But we still want to have some form of the behavior driven development aspect of it. So when we can then go into merging what that looks like. So we would write the descriptions of the Cypress tests in that format to help with that. Um, another example is obviously artificial intelligence. So we can see how 
that is becoming quite vocal now. Um, but I think it's important that we know if it's going to be an enabler or a distraction depending on how it's integrated within the testing. So, what do you think, uh, Riola? Is it an enabler or a distraction? I believe it's a distraction. <laughs> I think um, when we focus on some of our existing frameworks, yes, it's cool and snazzy to have like AI incorporated on them. But if we're ending up kind of putting a lot of time to try and merge it, um, a lot of time to kind of get that working, we end up spending more time just integrating that instead of actually automating. And so we're reducing that effort. But realistically, um, depending on the actual tasks, whether that is testing or not, we know that AI can help. I think a recent study showed that it actually helps to accomplish 25% more tasks and 40% higher quality results. So I might be um, tempted to go down that path soon. But yeah, that's the way that I would go for a kind of test infrastructure itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kyle, you want to add on to that? Sure. Um, I, I had two parts. I'll, I'll uh, respond to Ariola first. Um, so since we're uh, um, presented by Apple Tools here, I, I would want to say that the, the visual AI testing with Apple Tools uh, is something that I would not want to test without. Um, when we first started um, our new round of marketing sites, uh, there wasn't a lot available in terms of AI. Uh, so we were looking at having to write Selenium tests for everything that we wanted to check on the page. Is the header title correct? Is the logo right? Is this field here? Uh, and then anything that you didn't think to check or that the marketing team added to the page later is just lost. Um, so coming into using Apple tools where I can just say, go to this page, check it. The end uh, was a uh, a life life changing revelation uh, in in my software development career. Um, so we like when we launched our first site, we spent two weeks with a dozen developers and business people and product management checking our one site that was two hundred something pages. Uh, so that's hundreds of uh, personnel effort. Our, or hours to get that done. Uh, in contrast, using Apple Tools, uh, when we migrated uh, to our new platform this last year, we tested 60 something sites that each had between two and 600 pages of them. And just by myself and my machine and Apple Tools got through all of that 70, 80, 90,000 pages worth of testing in a week and a half. Wow. So that that can be the power of AI, um, especially with Apple tools. Load the page, set it up for how you want to test it with uh, Selenium button clicks and text field entry, and then say, Apple tools, you handle it. <laughs> yeah. I'll check in with you later. Um, and I'm guessing, Kyle, you all, no, did you also use the ultra fast grid to test on all the different browsers and devices as well? Yep. 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 So uh, that that gives us the ability uh, to test on any of our different browsers on any of our different devices, um, and we can like the ultra fast grid. I think our license is for like thirty five um, parallel tests. So I can go pretty much as fast as I want to go, um, as fast as my as we can <laughs> send pages to you. Um, yeah. So that's where we get that that benefit, being able to test however many sites we want in a very quick amount of time. Um, the other point that I wanted to, to circle back to, uh, Amit in our chat uh, has a very good suggestion about having clear roadmaps for planning automation. So we don't just uh, come into the office one day and say, you know what, we should test everything. Uh, that's something that requires a little bit of uh, forethought, a little bit of investigation and research, and time. So um, when you're scaling, it's it's not a click of a button, uh, typically. So that's something that you need to have a goal and then talk with your developers or your quality assurance team uh, and say, how do we get to this goal? 
How long is it going to take? What resources do we need? Um, and I, I believe Eric tacked on to that. Eric, if you wanted to uh, elaborate any further. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think there was someone else in the comments in the chat. I think it was Pankaj. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. It was uh, talking about the challenge with uh, deriving automated test cases uh, from the manual test cases. And just want you all to be aware of the Apple tools, again, is, is trying to meet you where that challenge is. Uh, they're working on some natural language processing uh, that will, you know, basically take your manual test and turn it into an, an automated test. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're helping work through some of those kinks, uh, but it is very exciting. Uh, and uh, knowing my group, we will put it through its paces to make sure that it's the best thing that uh, that it can be when it comes out. Yeah. Oh, that's uh, amazing insights. Uh, the part which I feel where it is a distraction right now, AI is a distraction right now, is the new tools and technologies. I think they're amazing. So I did a couple of webinars as well on, for example, ChatGPT and its impact, right? Or what uh, amazing work GitHub is doing in the space as well with Copilot and uh, I think Spaces, uh, the GitHub chat, there's a lot of interesting work happening over there. So but it's still evolving technology over there or how you can leverage it as part of your automation. I side with Ariola on that right now. I don't really know how practical it is really going to be for me to use that technology to make my work easier and my work being doing the testing, doing the automation, making sure I'm able to release faster with quality, right? So it's a balance I'm guessing that we need to maintain. Aptitudes has now been around for more than 10 years. Uh, so it's a very mature product and the value is there for everyone to see the minute you start using it. Uh, but there's a lot of other interesting technology that soon is not going to be a distraction. It's actually going to assist us and get better. We have to be conscious of the fact what aspects are going to work for us right now, what our priorities are and how it's going to help us move forward. Okay. So great. Now, thanks for that insight. I think that's, again, a very interesting aspect from an infrastructure and tooling perspective as well. How do we use that? Now, the other aspect that I would like to, again, tag on to this and expand the scope, right? It's OK to speak, uh, to think about these tools, technologies, how we are leveraging it uh, from one system perspective. But when you look at enterprise products, these are massively integrated systems that we are going to be testing eventually, right? We might be part of a team which is building one product, but that is integrated with multiple other products to offer an end solution to the users or to the businesses. Whatever you have mentioned so far, does that thought process need to evolve further when we are speaking about that level of scale? It's not just my product. It is about the integration of multiple products that is going to uh, provide that business value or the behaviors. So I can give you another example to try and quantify that, right? Uh, let's take an e-commerce uh, type of product. There is one consumer facing application. There is inventory that needs to be added. There is order management systems. There is payment systems. And that gets tied into the logistics and infrastructure teams where the actual products are going to be picked up from the warehouse or the uh, retailers shipped to different uh, to the consumers, right? So there's a massive systems that are integrated that we need to build and test uh, if it is working correctly. So Ariola, taking the example of the behavior, the BDD language of collaboration and making it explicit what the business value is. Do you think that thought process would still work in such scale or does that need to evolve further based on such scenarios? I definitely think um, regardless of the scale of a project, BDD itself is an, an enabler in a lot of this aspect. Um, when you're thinking about creating a software product, you are wanting to kind of write the tests in a way that you want to um, determine what your behavior would do on the software. And I think regardless of the size of the 
project that is something that will always be critical because if you think about um not doing that for instance just going ahead and perhaps just writing a bunch of kind of coding or a bunch of tests and then just trying to get that out the door what you'll have come across is maintenance costs down the line or um, skill sets so if more junior members are coming to the team who may not understand let's say um, the intricate details of the coding side like Eric mentioned before where you're thinking about Cyprus and the fact that that is easier to maintain let's say you're using Selenium for that side Selenium there is a learning to it that needs to be done to be able to utilize it efficiently and the way that BDD helps in that is everything is written in that uh, business readable language so then you can kind of say okay this is the scenario this is what behaviors looks like so then when you are actually scaling that, whether that is global or different projects you can actually use that as a template um, and make it as reusable as possible and that's the efficiency here is a framework that is reusable and scalable um, and that's how kind of bdd would help with that then you can pass that knowledge to let's say your clients or stakeholders who may not necessarily be technical but, but by reading from that aspect they'll understand okay this is how it fits directly with my requirements and that's how they get confidence as well awesome uh, that definitely makes a lot of sense uh, eric kyle do you want to add anything to that uh, you know, since, again, we're in the agency space, uh, we really don't get a lot of ch chance to do the web app things that I think where Ariola is talking about really would gain benefit from. Uh, but yeah, if, if we could get developers to do more tests, uh, I, think <laughs> I think that's a great thing uh, and will put us uh, in a spot where uh, if we had to scale, uh, it, it just puts us in a, in a better place uh, to mm -hmm. be at, in the end. Awesome, great. Uh, so uh, one challenge that I face uh, with such massively integrated systems, right? So again, I completely agree, Ariola, with what you said, the common language, understanding the big picture view uh, for everyone is extremely important. The bigger value out of that uh, given when then that you write comes if you are able to automate that, then it becomes your executable specs, right? It's executing requirements that you give the BDD to your product team, to your business team and say, these are the tests which are running in my CI on every change that is happening. And that gives an immense confidence to the teams, uh, to the business teams as well, that yes, the engineering team, the delivery team or whichever team we talk about uh, is understanding what the requirement is and they've actually made it an executing test so that we ensure the requirement is always met, okay? Now, uh, one thing that I'm quickly going to share my screen, I think this is an interesting uh, perspective, uh, how I have approached this particular problem of scale uh, is we are aware of the test automation pyramid. And this is a very old uh, diagram that I had drawn. The layers are going to be subjective based on what type of application you're building. But typically, this is what we focus on in each of our teams, right? Or, or the product that we are working on. What is the test pyramid and how am I going to automate the right type of test at the right layer? But in complex systems, in complex product environments, what is really required is to think about this. And again, going back to what Kyle said, right? You push the test, have frequent uh, or the quick tests automated at the lower layers of the pyramid and executing very frequently. Smaller, uh, the functional tests, end-to-end -end tests are fewer in number, which are not going to execute as frequently, right? But when you think about it from your different product perspective, you could think about this as where these tests are going to run as well, right? So in a developer environment, what type of tests you want to run? In your stubbed environment, for example, what additional types of tests you want to run? In your semi-integrated environment, what type of tests you want to run? In your fully integrated environment, which is your pre-prod of sorts, what type of tests you want to run? And then uh, actually there's integrated and pre-prod environment, depending on context of how complex that application is, 
you have to pretty much think of a test pyramid for each of the products and each type of test where should it run in your path to production i think that can become a very insightful way of saying how can i get value from my automation so what is your path to production and each product or each team having its own pyramid defining its own path to production and together when it comes across we have a bdd spec which is cutting across all the different products we have it running as part of your automated suite as well and that is going to tell us okay everything is running as expected so shift left have the developers definitely write more tests run it frequently in ci and uh, have that common dashboards common visibility tells you if your automation is actually adding value or not i thought i'll quickly share that uh, this is an insight this is actually something that i did for one of a banking products uh, core banking implementation uh, projects that i was working on uh, many years ago and uh, it added uh, really good value of course getting it to that stage of implementation takes a lot of effort from all the roles required but that's where everyone really needs to collaborate and take their ownership as well to make things happen okay so in interest of time i'm going to ask one question uh, to each of you and i would want uh, your perspective on this right if we are doing all these collaboration and processes practices tools technologies to make our automation scalable how do you know if you are really adding value in this overall ecosystem or not is the effort that you are putting in actually adding value towards the quality of the product what is your uh, perspective on that ariel will start with you what do you think about it where do you think the challenges lie what next would happen in that so i think this is where test strategy is very important um you want to kind of establish what your testing currently looks like um if that means there's a lot of manual testing effort how much of that is actually manual so you need to get some metrics really um and then you need to use that from an automation side of things so if you end up finding that the team doesn't um spend that much time testing manually then you need to kind of question yourself whether automation is a valuable aspect to your product if you're actually not going to add any effort um in terms of the time saved then it could potentially mean that there is no point to automate you want to make sure that you're you're increasing the quality of your product but you're also cutting on time spent so an example from our side is um I did point of sale automation and that took about um 2 weeks or so to do manual testing but then by doing automation you cut that down to about 2 days um so that is like a clear indicator that the amount of time that you're spending to automate will actually help you in the long run yes there is that kind of stance in the initial stages that you need to put some time and effort into doing that whether that is building the framework thinking of how to do that and so on um which may seem as if manual would be easier but that aspect to it um will definitely pay off in the end run when you're finding defects as quickly as possible through pipeline runs um when you're actually integrating that through nightly regression runs and so on which would take a lot of time if you thought about it from a manual point of view So yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Kai. Yeah, I'll add on to that. Um back to my previous story of uh migrating our uh all of our work onto a new platform. Um uh, that required quite a bit of retooling. Um uh, working in Adobe Experience Manager, we were migrating from uh managed service to uh, Adobe Experience Manager as a cloud service, um uh, which works slightly differently. So we had to touch I don't know 60 or 70% of our code and tweak it to run in the cloud. So that's uh anybody that is listening to that and says you touched 70% of your code. Uh yeah. Um uh, this was 60 sites, 70, 80, 90,000 pages. Um I don't want to test that manually. So um it, automation is a lot like uh 
at least in this, this instance, it's like a seatbelt. Like, you don't think you'll need it, but when you need it, you better have it. <laughs> uh, so being able to, to go into that planning session where they said, we've got six months to move all of these sites, and someone says, oh, God, we're going to have to test that. Uh, being able to say, ah, I got it, give me two weeks, <laughs> was uh, something that was uh, definite value to everybody else in our group. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to use this, Kyle, very frequently. Automation is not a silver bullet, but it's a seatbelt. Uh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Eric? Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to use that too, Kyle. Um, yeah, I, I just think that you'll know that you get value from it, uh, to Ariola's point, is if you uh, know that you've reduced the amount of manual testing. Uh, whether that's you know forty percent or seventy percent, um, that's that's how you can tell you that your your automation efforts are, are adding up. Uh, the other thing too, just to be mindful of, is that you know go in knowing that not everything is going to be automated, nor should it be automated. So that's that's definitely something to keep in the back of, of or probably in front of mind uh, as you're going through and coming up with a strategy to to put automation in place. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, before I hand it over to Pam and let her uh, guide us on the question and answers, I just want to summarize one thing, right? I think there are so many different challenges. There are so many different ways that you can overcome those challenges. It really comes down to taking that step back and seeing where we are, not looking at the symptom, but what might be the root cause of that challenge and then try to figure out how to overcome that. That is very important. Uh, the other uh, point that I would like to make is, uh, Eric, you mentioned, how can we get developers to write more tests? And this is something that has worked for me in the past. I say work with a lot of confidence, but of course it's not worked 100%. Uh, but I don't like to think of it as a test strategy, unfortunately, because test strategy is a testing team thing. That's how it is correlated, right? Uh, the mind sort of connects it that way. That's how I always introduce myself. I started my career in testing, but I graduated to thinking about quality. And when you think about it as quality, then the role does not matter. When you start thinking about it for any product, whether it's a small product or an enterprise product, what is the quality strategy that we need to have for this? And which are the different roles that are there in the system, in the organization? What role do they play in helping bring uh, work on that quality strategy? So the business team gets needs to get involved over there. Product team needs to get involved over there. Developers, testers, DevOps, SRE, whoever else that might be there. All roles need to play a part in that quality strategy. If you sign off on the quality strategy, this is what we are going to do. Everyone has to do their part. And that definitely helps people come uh, on board a little bit more better uh, in that aspect, right? So uh, that is what I wanted to share. Uh, Kyle, you had uh, one uh, last thought on that as well. Yeah, yeah. So I'm from uh, Missouri, the show me state. Uh, so so uh, one of the things that uh, we like to say when uh, we're, we're doing uh, reviewing pull requests or moving a story into our quality assurance server. Uh, and our, our story says, uh, this form submits this information to this URL. Show me. <laughs> uh, so uh, one of the things that we try to follow just uh, down on the development level is uh, self-documenting code. And you know what's really great about self-documenting code? It translates really well into tests, into unit tests. Uh, so all of your functions says submit form, and that very easily trans into an it submits the form test. Yeah. Uh, so if you're if you're following your uh, your software development principles, uh, it should be a very easy lift to also be able to take the extra time to say I've written this function. Let's write the test that says the function does what it says it does. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for that. Pam, over to you. What a great discussion today. Um, thank you, everyone.
Um, I do want to remind everyone that the um, Q&A tab, we've got a couple questions there. So if you have any other questions for the panel, please add them now. But let's go ahead and take a look at the polls. The first one I want to show is the what is your work style preference? And so it looks like about 33% of the respondents prefer to work remote, um, but 61% uh, like a hybrid format. Uh, any thoughts on that team? Yes. Um, so I, I had, uh, this was on our list of, you might get asked this before we leave. Uh, so the, the benefit that I see of being in an office is spontaneous conversation. Um, and that, that can generate value. So walking around the office uh, or even just sitting at your desk and unintentionally seeing or hearing a discussion that's relevant to your work or something that you have expertise in, um, that's something that is a lot harder to do um, when you're working remote. Uh, so like just a, you're going to the bathroom, a casual, how's it going, turns into, I'm having trouble with this thing and it's frustrating me, or I just did this cool new thing. Um, that's something uh, that you can either help or say, hey, we could use that. That would be great. That would save us a ton of time. Uh, it's working remotely. It's very easy to get tunnel vision or to even just say, I got to make sure that my manager sees that I'm getting output. Um, you, you lose a little bit of that just uh, off the cuff, unintentional interaction that just uh, it's a little magic into our day that uh, makes it a lot easier to transfer knowledge in between people or teams. Yeah. One other important thing, Kyle, right? Uh, along with that, right, of course, is when you are in office, you have that breathing space between meetings, for example. When you are remote, there is no breathing space at all. You are back to back packed. There's no time for subconscious thinking about what just happened. What next can you could you have done about that, right? So there's no subconscious time yeah. remaining to think and process what is going on, uh, which happens if you're in office, you will move away from the meeting room, go back to your desk. There's that time that you're thinking uh, subconsciously, which is a very big uh, value add for sure. Yep. And especially in meetings, those side conversations that the speaker always says, we'll wait. Uh, those are where things happen. Um, the, the speaker is giving you a problem or a goal or a direction, and those side conversations are where all of the interesting ideas come through. Yeah. And, and that's a lot harder to do on a, a Teams meeting or a Zoom where only one person can really talk at a time. Uh, yeah. So it, it requires a lot more conscious effort to have all of those side channels when you're working in a space where only one person can speak audibly at a time. Our other poll was, does the use of common tools and frameworks help in large distributed teams? And the audience overwhelmingly agreed that yes, it does. Nearly 87% of the audience uh, felt like it did. And 13% said no, and there were no not sure on that. So that's interesting. Well, at least there's a clear answer you know, to that, right? And depending on the context, I would also probably sway between both of these because if I'm forced to use a common tool set, it might not be the best possible tool set of choice for the product that I'm working on. So there is a risk to that. Right? I'm going to use what Ariola was also mentioning earlier. I'm forced to use something else which I may not be good at or it is not going to solve the problem in the best possible way or the most efficient way for my particular product. But on the other hand, if you think about it from an organization perspective, it makes a huge value add by having a common tool set because that also means that it becomes easy for team members to move from one product to the other internally and not really have to worry about, oh, am I right skill for this particular uh, team or not, right? It is easy, uh, I know the tool set, I just have to understand the product, the domain, I'm going to start contributing towards that. So there is pros and cons in that aspect. And uh, I'm guessing the answers are also based on individual context over there. 
Harika asks, team members may resist automation due to fear of job loss or lack of understanding of its benefit. How do we encourage them even though a testing process is mandatory? I think Ariola, you had a comment on this. Yeah, um, my comment is more around using proof of concepts to kind of show the benefit of it. Um, I haven't come across anyone being resisting um, in terms of automation due to fear of job loss. So I'm not sure um, what specifically is around that, but I can answer in terms of the benefit side where proof of concepts will really help to kind of provide a form of evidence in a way to say that, okay, this is our product, this is how we automate or can potentially automate and what we actually save from that, whether that is reduced manual testing effort, um, finding defects a lot faster, finding them perhaps in the lower environment. So if you are automating, you're putting them in the pipeline, running them on a dev like a development environment instead of going into pre-prod or so on, that helps a lot in the defect side. Um, so these are some of the benefits and how to kind of show that from a proof of concept stage. Um, there is definitely a learning curve and some of the kind of side of things um, you do want to kind of understand testing as a whole um, and that's where your more senior members potentially can help with that KT and um, that knowledge transfer for that. Yeah. And I'd throw a comment on here as well. Um, I see I kind of in this instance um, pair automation and AI in the same thoughts for me. Uh, we're we're knowledge workers. We're thought workers. Um, so, automation and AI is not something that we should think of as taking our jobs. It's something that we should be leveraging in order to do our jobs better and to be able to provide more value from what we can do on top of automation and AI. And the last question, Nikki asks, what are your recommended steps and consideration for initiating a test automation initiative when starting out as a junior? Eric, you had a resource, I think. Uh, yeah, I like Ariola's uh, response as well, to start small. But uh, anybody that's really interested in getting started in this, uh, Apple Tools has a, a great resource called Test Automation University. I definitely uh recommend you all taking a look at that if you're interested in it. And also, you know, if you've been around the game for a while, you can also pick up something new. Uh, it's, it's a great resource. Also, I would like to add one other aspect over here, right? Uh, the concept of build versus buy is not new. But there's an other dimension as well, build, buy, reuse. We don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, there will be great resources that you can use open source resources, for example, that you can, frameworks that might be there, that, can, that you can use to quickly get started and build on top of that. You don't have to start from scratch every time. As your comfort level grows uh, for learning and starting out, then of course you can expand into saying, okay, could I have done this on my own? That is more from a learning perspective as well, right? So. That is uh, another thing to think about. Build, buy, reuse, and use it in the right combination can give you great value. Again, thank you everyone for a great discussion. Thank you audience for your questions and your comments. Um, Apple Tools is on a mission to reinvent every step of the testing process with our next generation platform for AI back test automation. With Apple Tools Eyes, Visual AI helps you perform visual assertions that re reduce automation development efforts while improving coverage. With the ultra-fast grid, you can scale your tests to run against any browser or mobile device at lightning speed. And with the execution cloud, you can automatically heal broken locators in your sledding test. If you have questions or would like to see a personalized demonstration of any of these specific tools or of the entire platform, our testing specialists are ready to help. You can get in touch by clicking one of the links in the chat or by visiting applatools.info slash ACF. There's also a link where you can try Apple Tools Eyes yourself with a free account. You can claim it today at applatools.info slash R90. Thank you for joining. We look forward to seeing you again soon.